Okay. I, I'm not not following. Uh, but I, I could never Okay. Okay. And it's still there, but now there have been options uh -huh. that says continue. So I just press continue and Okay. Well that's good. That's good. Um, all right, last time we were talking about validation and we kind of rushed through client side validation. Uh, so I'd like to go back and revisit that briefly. Um, not so much the, the exact JavaScript statements um, so much, we can certainly look at them, but the mechanism by which the um, client side code will either permit or, uh, or, or decline the submission of the form to the server. All right. So if we look here, what we had is we had, and this is client side code. that if we did not pick a, an option for the answer, it says that the user must choose option. We'll also clean that up because I hate those alerts and I'm not going to leave that stand. But anyhow, let's look at this. Let's in fact do that first. How do we clean that up? Well, what we could do is we could put next to this, we could put a span with an ID of something like answer error. And we can go in here and say, instead of alert must choose option, we can say document dot get element by ID, answer error, dot inner HTML equals must choose an option. All right, so same idea and works a lot better if you ask me. All right, now. As far as the mechanism where it, it keeps the form from submitting, because notice we've stayed on the client page even though we've clicked the submit button. We have the submit button, we click it, yet if there's an error, we don't go to the server page. You never see any activity on the status bar and that other page doesn't load up or anything. It just doesn't make it to the, to the page that was listed as the action. And that is because of this mechanism here. Notice what we're doing. First of all, our JavaScript is coded on the onSubmit event. All right. In this specific case, we could probably make it equivalent by putting it on the onClick event of this button, but the onSubmit event is preferred just in case the form is submitted in some other way. Um, it's possible to have two submit buttons on a form. All right. Um, you could have, for example, click here to add this row, click here to delete it, or something like that, or click here to update it, click here to delete it. So you could have two, uh, two submit buttons. <clears throat> you could submit through JavaScript code. There's a lot of ways that this could be submitted. And by putting the code on the on submit event, we guarantee that that fires off no matter how the form is submitted. So you might as well get in the habit, even if you only have the one submit button, of putting the code on an on submit event of the form. <coughs> Now, if you look at this, the onSubmit says return, and then it has the function validate form. That return is sort of the mechanism that um, allows it to decide whether to continue or to halt submitting the form to the server-side script. If you notice, this function return form returns a Boolean, be valid which is either true or false. True means that the form is okay, right? False means that there's a problem with it. And we follow the same sort of scheme that we, we always have in that we assume that the form is valid and we look for 
counter cases. We look for cases of where the form isn't valid. That's actually easier to code because as soon as you find one thing that's not valid about the form, you know the form isn't valid. To prove that a form is valid, you'd have to prove that everything is valid. And that, that would be harder to code. All right. But anyhow, notice that we have, we set our B valid variable to true. If that, if there's nothing in that uh, option, uh, that drop down, we set B valid to false, and then we return B valid. What does that mean to return B valid? It means send it, send the answer of false back to whoever called you. Well, who called it? This on submit event called it. So valid, validate form, that function, gets sent back a false. So the value of that function is false because that's what was returned. That false we are returning to the on submit event. All right? And the on submit event, if it gets a false, it knows, hey, stop the presses, don't go ahead and submit to the, to the server. If the on submit event gets a true, then it knows it's okay to submit the form to the server. So that's a mechanism by which we cancel or don't cancel. Let me show you the symptom if you forget this, because a lot of times students will do this. They'll go in and they'll forget to say return valid, validate form. Excuse me. What will happen then is that function will call. It'll return a value of false or true, but that value never gets sent back to that on submit event. So that on submit event doesn't know whether it should cancel or proceed, in which case it just proceeds. So if we forget the return, then we don't pick an option. We should notice it very briefly flash the error message, but then it will go and submit anyhow. All right, so it very briefly flashed the error message, and then it went and submitted it anyhow. Because we didn't tell it to cancel it. What tells it to cancel it is the word return. Because that return is either going to send the true or the false back to that on submit event, and a false sent back to the on submit event is a cancel to, uh, is a signal to cancel submitting, whereas a true is a, is a signal to continue on submitting. All right. We had talked last time about doing now server side validation. All right. So what I'm going to do, well, we'll see how easy it is to turn off JavaScript um, to, to demonstrate the fact that you can do it. All right, let's go in here under tools, under internet options. I think it's on this one. The fact that you have someone who is familiar with this sort of stuff and still has to search through to figure out how to turn it off might lead you to say, gee, is it all that important? And the answer is, yeah, it still is. To be sure, most people will not turn their JavaScript off, but it's still a good idea to do. Okay, I give up. We'll turn it off. Let's see. Maybe we'll run this in Firefox. Firefox, I have a fighting chance to figure out where to disable JavaScript. Uh, let's see. Oh, right there. Content. Enable JavaScript. There you go. So, now if we go and run this, it 
it goes ahead and submits it anyhow, because that JavaScript just has no effect whatsoever, because JavaScript is disabled. All right. Um, there is, by the way, I guess now is as good a time to mention it, a no script tag. And no script tags will display if JavaScript is not enabled. So in this case, actually it's kind of good that we can have IE running JavaScript and Firefox not, because we can compare and contrast. Um, Firefox knows that it doesn't have JavaScript enabled. If we look at IE, we don't get that message because it does have JavaScript enabled. All right. So we can test it either way now, which is, which is cool. All right, what we're going to do is we're going to build now code into our server-side um, scripting to check to see if there's anything there. And in order to do that, we can look on the server side and notice that the answer is an empty string. All right. Now this is where it depends on the exact control. All right. Remember, a drop down there always is a selected index in a drop down in HTML. So a drop down will always have a value. All right. Even if that value is an empty string. A radio button, however, will not always have a value. If you have a radio button collection on your page and you have two radio buttons, let's say we had a true or false question on this quiz, all right, <coughs> excuse me, um, if we didn't pick either of it, that radio button simply wouldn't have a value on it as opposed to having a value of blank. So there's a few things that we can do and I want to introduce them to you now, and then we'll sort of build on this as we go through in, in future examples. First thing is there is, we can have an if statement to see if the value of the variable equals an empty string, similar to what we're doing in JavaScript. And the way that would look would be something like this. If dollar sign variable, whatever the variable is, equals an empty string, then we do something, otherwise we do something else. All right, so that's one way that we can do it. And that will work with text boxes and that will work with um, drop downs. That won't work, however, with radio buttons. Now, there's no radio buttons in this example, but just to mention to you in case you encounter one. And that's where you do an is set. All right. So I can do something like this if is set then do something. So I could say if is set request radio button. All right. And it will tell me if it has a value. All right. So we can do that. Let's pull up some documentation on it. And again, it returns a true if the variable exists and has a value other than a true if the variable doesn't exist. And in the case of a radio button, it would not have a value up on the query string, so therefore that variable wouldn't exist. The other thing that we could do is we could use the isNumeric test 
uh, to find out whether it is uh, a numeric value or not. If we wanted to do server-side validation to test if this is a number. In this case, we have a drop-down, so all we really need to do is check to see if the variable is, uh, has a value or not. Now, I'm going to go in, in, in just to remind you um, of the code. Let's look at the code that we currently have. And if you remember, we did this two different ways. One method, I went into PHP, did all my processing, and then in the middle of the PHP, I outputted some HTML. All right. The other method is to pop in and out of HTML and just use the PHP to fill little bits in, fill little blanks in. In other words, I wrote, my, your answer was, that's an HTML. Then I popped in a PHP to output the value of the name variable. I created my paragraph and smack dab in the middle of it, I went and had a series of if statements. So I had an if statement to determine uh, what style should this be. Is this correct or incorrect? Now again, um, there's cases where one or the other of these approaches will be better. All right, you don't have to do them both, obviously. You just pick one of the approaches that works and, and, and stick with it. Um, it's good to know both methods, again, just in case you see any examples. And in addition, um, there are times when one way is sort of a little easier than the other way. All right? So I'm going to get rid of the second method in this case. I think, I think in this case, the first method is better. And we're going to add some, some server-side validation code in there. If you remember, when we looked at that code, especially the second method, that code can get ugly. If you remember, I said that unlike things such as ASP.NET, you're not nudged at all in the direction of making your code good. All right? Instead, it's sort of a free-for-all, sort of the Wild West out there. You can do really whatever you want. And while you may think that's a good thing, gee, I don't have to worry about this framework, I can code it however you want, actually it's not a good thing because you can create really, really messy code. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to write some good code here following good practices of taking, and instead of having just a giant blob of code, we're going to divide things into functions. All right. So, for example, in this case, what do we want to do? Well, we want to look at the data that came in. If it's valid, we want to go and check the answer and see if it's right or wrong and display the results. If it's not valid, we want to display some sort of error message saying that the user has not filled in the fields. All right. So, the way I would do this, and a good way to do this, is we can simplify the code quite a bit simply by breaking down into two functions. All right? And what we'll do, and this is really what we're going to do in a lot of the PHP code, is we'll sort of have our main line that's not included in a function. And it will call, it will sort of be the boss function. It sort of runs things and calls the functions, the other functions as needed. This will be fairly clean because for the most part, all this is going to be is little function calls. All right? Do this. If the result was this, then do that. If the result was this, then do that. All right? The nitty gritty work of it will happen in functions. And each function will be self-contained for the most part and, um, will um, take its input and, and produce the output um, that you need. In this particular case, I'm going to break this down into two functions plus sort of my mainline routine. And first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to test to see, I'm going to run a function that asks, is input valid? 
and there'll be a function for that. Then I'm going to say if that variable is valid, then I want to call the function display results. Otherwise, I want to call the function display error message. Now keep in mind this isn't the only way you could do it. You could write this several different ways and come up with the same result. What I'm trying to impress with this example though is to break down this into little pieces. Instead of having a giant chunk of code that does all these things sort of as part of the main line, have a main line that's sort of the boss that calls the functions it needs to do and then decides what to do next. So, what I'm going to do is really all of this All of this is my display results function. So I'm going to put it at the bottom of the, of the program and I'm going to define it as a function, which again the syntax will be very similar to JavaScript. And then I'm going to have my main, main line routine in the middle of the HTML to go and call that function. Now everyone's clear about the difference between defining a function and calling it, right? Here we've defined a function. We've said these block of statements constitute display results. Up here we're actually going to call that function. And I'm not doing the validation yet, I'm just moving in that direction of separating the code into little, little chunks. So here I'm going to call that function. And let's go and make sure that it works. I really haven't added any functionality to this. All I've done is... Oh, the answer is two. All I've done is move that code into its own function. Why? Well, notice how much cleaner it is. It doesn't really clutter up the rest of the code. Wrong one. It doesn't clutter up the rest of the code. We have all our HTML, and then we sort of have our main line, all right? And all it's going to do is it's going to call these other functions. And there, those functions are going to go do their thing, and they're going to be isolated. If I'm not worried about this section of code, then I don't have to see it. That's sort of the good news about this. All right? I can even, when we may talk about this today, or we may talk about this next time, we can even make an include file. All right? What's an include file? An include file is like an external um, JavaScript file or an external CSS file where we can put a chunk of PHP code in there and we can bring that in. All right? And it's especially valuable for um, reusable code, if there's code I ever want to reuse on page to page to page. But it also can be valuable in the case of, of making your code very streamlined. All right. Now I'm going to go and I'm going to add in the function to validate this. So I'm going to say dollar sign valid equals is input valid. If dollar sign valid, then I want to display the results. Otherwise,
I want to display the error message. Now, here's the thing I talked about before, I think. I talked about the notion of a stub function. And what is a stub function? Well, that's where we may not be ready to write all the function, but we can put in sort of a placeholder. And that way we can sort of test to make sure our mechanics are right in the way that we're calling and integrating our functions together is correct, even before we're, we're doing that, where we have the uh, completed uh, function. So I could put in here a function for is input valid. And to start out, I could just return true. And not even actually do the test, right? Obviously it doesn't, you know, it shouldn't stay like this when you're done, but I could go and do that. Now, I could put in my function for display error message that maybe just prints something like um, input missing or something like that. And then we can test out where we are at this point. All right. Notice that we, we really haven't done the validation yet, but we've created a mechanism to call the validation, check to see if it's valid or not. If it's valid, continue processing the, fo the form. Otherwise, display an error message. All we need to do then is fill in the details of that one function to get it to work. It's a very modularized way of thinking, taking the big problem and instead of trying to write a giant main routine that does all these hundreds of different things or dozens of different things, um, you write in terms of having sort of a boss function that's responsible for calling each little function in order and sort of doing the switching, co coordinating between what function gets called and then having each little function do its own thing. And if you're not ready to write one of them, um, you can still test what you have by doing the stub function idea and returning a fake true all the time or whatever. So let's go and, and try this out. So, yep, that works. I'm going to go in and change it from a fake true to a fake false. Oops. And sure enough, I get the uh, error saying that it's missing. Why did it give me an error even though the data wasn't missing? I did pick something on there. Well, because I, I lied. My stub function is always going to return false. It's always going to say the, the, the field is invalid. So really, I'm not testing the actual code of the validation. I'm testing the mechanism of linking all these different modules together. And that's a very important thing in programming, to be able to, to, to think modularly uh, of breaking down a big, big job into several smaller jobs and then get that flow of, of doing it to work. Now, what we can do then is now we can actually write the, the validation. And the validation is going to look a lot like uh, the JavaScript validation, except for first of all the, the basic syntax differences between PHP and JavaScript. Secondly, where we're getting the data from. In this case, um, you know, in, in JavaScript we use the DOM to point to the data. Here we use the request object to, to point to the data.
we actually don't need the else, right? We've already initialized it. But we do need to return that. And now let me go to Firefox where JavaScript is not enabled. And if we give it a value, it works. If we don't give it a value, it tells us that the input's missing. All right. Again, it's up to you to sort of enforce some structure in your PHP code um, because you don't have the neat little events in, in, in separate code behind files and separate HTML files and all that that you have in, um, in um, what do I want to say, in, um, in the .NET framework. Now, let's think this through. All right. Any questions about what I have so far, by the way? Correct. In other words, notice, notice the difference between the errors that we get in Firefox where JavaScript is disabled and in IE where it is JavaScript is enabled. Here PHP is disabled. So we go and we don't put a value in. We click it. The form submits to the other page and that other page displays that the data is missing. So this one isn't the same page. If we were to view this in Internet Explorer, it stayed on that page. So JavaScript is enabled, so it was able to do that without going back to the server. Which is really the win of doing the validation on the, on the client side, is that you, uh, you can uh, display those messages and give quick feedback without taking the round trip to the server. Now, other questions about this? Let's think this through. All right? Let's imagine. get where JavaScript is not enabled. So, there's only there's a one question quiz, not that big a deal, right? We click to grade it and our server side validation is going to catch the fact that, that um, they forgot to enter in a value. What would we like to have happen at this point? In other words, right now it says input is missing. Okay, should go back to the other page. All right. So, let's look at how we could do that. All right. One way we could do that is I can give a link over here. So if we forget to an answer, we click grade, all right, we have a link to go back. All right, that works pretty good. We might even be able to redirect, but let's imagine for a second that there were two questions on here, all right? There were two questions on there, then the problem that would run into is that 
they may have answered one question and not answered the other question. Right? So, if we simply made a link to go back to that first page, what if there were ten questions, all right, and they answered nine of them but forgot to answer one? What would that link back to the first page do? It'd reset it all and you'd start with an empty form, all right, which wouldn't be good. You know, 99 you entered, one you didn't, sorry, start again from scratch. So, a link back to the original page really isn't what we want to do. All right. What do we want to do? What would, what would we want to, in a perfect world, do? Yeah. We would want to go, we would want to redisplay the form, all right, and show the stuff that was filled in, show it as being filled in, and let the user fill in the missing pieces. So in a perfect world, that's what we'd want. Now, could we do that with the link? We could, but it would be difficult. We'd have to pass all that data back to the first page. We'd have to form a query string on that first, uh, on this link that passed all the answers back over to that. All right? So here's what we're going to do instead. All right? And we're going to do this, we're going to do this with a one question quiz, even though it might not immediately be apparent to you. All right, the value of it. When we add a second and third question, it will become apparent to you. All right. And what we're going to do is we're going to redo this so that we don't have two pages. We just have one page. We have a page that both displays the form and grades the quiz. All right, and does the validation. Now, um, those of you that have done uh, .NET stuff may recognize this as being a postback, right? When a page calls itself, that's called a postback. In other words, one page is both the form, contains both the form and the code to process the form. In order for this to work, the page has to be smart enough to know what it should do. There's essentially going to be two modes a page, going to, page is going to be in. There's going to be a um, display the form mode, and there's going to be a grade the form mode. All right. The first time through, you want to display the form. The second time through, you want to validate. And depending on whether the data was valid or not, you either want to display the form again, right, or you want to grade the quiz. So if we can draw a flow chart, our code is going to look like this. Is this the first time? Yes, no. If it's the first time, we want to display the form. If it's not the first time, we want to is form valid. If it's valid, we want to process the form in this, in this case, um, you know, grade the quiz or, or whatever. If the form is not valid, we want to display the error messages and then display the form. So that's our little flow chart of what we want to do.
first time the page is displayed, we have to give the user the chance to answer the question. So that's a no-brainer. All right, we display the form. If it's not the first time, if it's the second time, we look to see if the form is valid or not. If it's not valid, we display our error message and we display the form. If the form is valid, then we go and process the form, grade the quiz, do whatever we need to do. Now, we know how to do this stuff, dare I say. Displaying the form is simply going to be copying and pasting that code from the other page, right, into a little PHP function. All right, so that's going to be very straightforward. The question then becomes, how do we know if we are um, the first time through or not the first time through? How do we know the first time this page is being called? Look at the URL for a second. I know this isn't the same thing because we're, we, we currently have two pages, but look at the URL, then look at the URL. All right? Look at the URL, then look at the URL. What's the difference between the two? There's something on the query string. All right? So there's something on the query string. So we can look at to see if there's a value on the query string. And if there is, we know it's not the first time through. If it is, the query string is empty, we know it is the first time through and we can display the form. So, we have about a little less than 10 minutes left. I'm going to try to uh, get this going. And, and, and talk about it, but we should uh, review this on Wednesday as well. All right. What I'm going to do first of all is I'm going to make a copy of this, this guy, and call it quiz post back, just so that we keep the original quiz intact. I'm going to copy this here from the form. And I'm going to go into my quiz post back and I'm going to make a PHP function. That displays a form. Now that display form, if you remember right, was all HTML, right? Well, that's fine. We can get out of PHP mode, post our HTML, and then get back into PHP mode for the ending curly bracket. So this is a PHP function, but the bulk of it is HTML. All right. Now, we can go in and we can First of all, look to see what's on the query string. And this we could do a bunch of different ways. The way I'm going to do it is I'm going to look to see if that button has a value or not. All right? And that button is called BTN submit. So based on what I said earlier in class, I'm going to look to see if it is set. Is set is saying is it does it have a value? All right? And I'm going to say if dollar sign request btn submit actually if is set that Uh, 
Another way of saying this, and this is where comments are good because it's not immediately apparent what that statement means until you've done a little bit of PHP coding. I'm going to put in a comment. I'm going to say, check to see if form being posted back to itself. Yes, it is a post back. I'm going to display the error message. Then I'm going to display the form. Otherwise, this code here represents first time page is called, in which case all I want to do is display the form. Which if you look, is virtually identical to this, except when I drew the flowchart, I asked the opposite question. I said, is it the first time? And that is true, that is false. When I coded it, I pretty much said, is this the second time? And if it's the second time, then I do that. Otherwise, it must be the first time and I do that. Other than that, the flowchart's the same. Now, again, notice how this being the main line of the PHP, this being sort of the boss function, it doesn't do a lot other than calling other functions and checking things to, and deciding what to do next. This is a good way to keep the code very clean because you could write this as one giant monstrosity, but it would get to be very, very hard to read. All right? So, let's go and let's sure, make sure that this works. I don't have any little silly uh, syntax errors or, or whatever. Which I do. Line 29. All right, first time through, nothing on the query string. All right, so therefore, this is false. There's nothing on the query string called btn submit. There's no value on the query string called that. And that's what is set is testing for. It's saying, is there a value in it? And no, there isn't. Therefore, I'm going to do this. The first time through, I'm going to display the form. Now, the second time through, when I go and give an answer to this, now there is something in the query string for that. Therefore, this condition is true. I'm going to see if it's valid. And in this case, I did put a valid answer in there. So it's going to go and display the result, and it tells me that I was right with that uh, answer, or it tells me it's wrong, whatever. It was right. Okay. Let's go in this time and and not uh, put in a proper answer. Oh, my mistake. I forgot to change the the uh, action to quiz post back. So take two. All right. I answer. Tells me I was wrong. All right. I go in and not put an answer, 
it gives me the error message, then it redisplays the form. I'm going to change that from being a link, just because we really don't need it to be a link now. All right, so we've gotten our error message, and we've redisplayed the form so that they can go and correct it and get their stuff graded. All right, key things about this, uh, about the examples today, is first of all, um, the modularity of this is very important. Um, from what we saw last time, your code can really become very messy if you just have one giant blob of code. All right. Um, because PHP gives you so much flexibility on how to do things, you're not sort of pushed into uh, good programming practices. Therefore, you have to enforce them on yourself. And a good way to do that is to think very modularized and, and break down a bigger problem into smaller problems. So you have your main line, which calls these functions in sequence, and then, and then you have the functions that do just one little piece of it. Uh, the notion of server-side validation was pretty simple. We could use the test value for an empty string, or we can use the isSet um, uh, function to do that. Uh, then there's the idea of the postback. And the postback um, really is a way of getting around the issue of what happens when the data is incomplete. Um, you don't want to simply refresh the original page, because that would lose all the data and yet figuring out a way to pass all that data back to the first page would be a pain. All right? Therefore, what typically is done is a postback is done, whereas one page actually serves both as the form and the code that processes the form. Key to that working is being able to distinguish between those two modes, and usually what you do is you look to see if the button was pressed. In other words, if there's a value for it on the query string. And if there is, you know the button was pressed, and you can assume it's not the first time. Otherwise, you can assume that it was the first time, and just display the form. What we'll do next time is we'll look at um, adding extra questions to this. Because really, this is where you're going to get the benefit of the post back. Um, you know, they're, 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 with, with one field, the, the data is either entered or not, right? Uh, and really, this, this benefits you when you have uh, the possibility of incomplete data. So we'll look at, at, uh, at uh, multiple questions um, on the next quiz. All right. We'll see you over in lab.